But luckily, uh, we are able to uh, talk about what Castro and Castroism meant both for Cuba and for the rest of the world with our four guests. We're joined here in the studio by Oliver Cam and by Pedro Perez Sardui. And we're joined from Manchester by George Galloway, who's uh, in Manchester, and by Frank Calzon, who's in Washington. Um, can we start with you, George Galloway? How do you think he's going to be remembered? Well, I think throughout the third world in particular, and Latin America specifically, he's already a legend, and he's already lit a path with, uh, which others are following. In Brazil, Argentina, uh, Chile, uh, Bolivia, countries that were formerly grim prison states under military juntas. Uh, you can't get elected now in Latin America unless you're a friend of Fidel and an opponent of George Bush. So I think even long before his death, I okay. hope, he will have achieved legendary status. Mr. Calzon, you can't deny his significance, whether you agree with it, and I know you don't agree with it. Well, Castro is as significant historically as Stalin uh, remains significant, or other dictators. By the way, it's not true that you cannot get elected uh, unless you're a friend of Castro. The Costa Rican people and many others elect Democrats that have nothing to do uh, with the Castro regime. Okay, well now, let, Pedro, you were a teenager when the revolution happened in Cuba, weren't you? Just fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen years old, and you're a black Cuban. I am. Obviously. Um, tell us how, for someone of your generation, Castro will be recalled. I mean, to me, for sure, for giving back the dignity that we didn't have before 1959. Many people forget about that um, Cuba was under a kind of pseudo republic since 1902, imposed by the Americans until 1958. All along this year, I was born in 1943, so I remember quite well how difficult it was for my family, for my people, to be human being in Cuba. I mean, then the revolution really, it was not granted because we used to have a long history of fighting back against the slavery during the, actually, in the, the, the election on the 24th. It's about that precisely when the second war against Spain took place. When did it go wrong? What do you mean in that sense? When Castroism. I don't think that it get it wrong. I mean, we've been harassed all the way since 1958. I mean, when you have, so when you've been harassed to even to, to make the most uh, simple thing, it's very tough. Oliver Camp, what do you think uh, Castro will be remembered mainly for? He is a historical aberration. In a generation, much of the continent of Latin America has gone from brutal, corrupt military dictatorship to stable democratic government, much of it under parties of the moderate left. Castro, if you exclude the influence of subventions from Venezuela and remittances from expatriates back to Cuba, has bequeathed a, a stagnant, corrupt, one-party state that is a, a running sore in international relations. By the way, let me correct a couple of things from your uh, introduction real quick. It is not true. And most political scientists will tell you that Cuba was simply a backward, uh, poor country, as you indicated. Cuba was among the top uh, developed uh, Latin American countries. There was a dictatorship. It was corrupt. But, uh, but Castro didn't come to power because of poverty in Cuba. Uh, secondly, most of what you, I guess, you, you're, you're in England, so you want to talk about foreign policy. I'm Cuban. I want to talk about what the Cuban people are suffering. Okay, uh, so let me talk about all right, to, George Galloway. Let me say this. Let, hang on a let second. Me say you, this. You've had a good, yeah. you've, you've had a good say. We're just going to bring in George Galloway here. George Galloway, what do you make of the fact that when Castro seized power in Cuba, he overthrew a dictator, and he's now one of the few remaining dictators left in the Americas? I don't think that dictator does it. You know, when Hitler was at the Channel ports, we had a national government. We suspended normal politics. We cast Sorry, aside. who's Hitler in this comparison? Well, uh, George Bush. He's the George president. Bush is Hitler, is he? Yeah, well, in this comparison, because the United States has, as your own package made clear, uh, had you an unremitting policy of aggression, subversion, invasion, and has allowed Florida, from which Mr. Calzon draws his strength, to become a bastion of even 
terrorist outrage against the people in Cuba. Sorry, you said. So, see, see, uh, well, let's get this. I'd like to get this straight, if I may, please. Is it your assertion that the reason there is no democracy in Cuba? It's the fault of the United States. Well, it isn't the case that there is no democracy, but the deficiencies in democracy are because it's in a state of war. When we were in a state of war, our democracy was also curtailed. That's normal. 75 miles from Cuba is the most powerful country in the world, which has spent the best part of 50 years trying to kill the president and destroy the society that was being built. But so you can failed. That's the interesting thing. But failed. The Western world hasn't known how to handle this man, has it, Oliver Kemp? No, it hasn't. But don't make me laugh, Mr. Galloway. You have a record as long as my arm of justifying autocracy across the world. And you admire Castro because of the way he rules. Western policy has been counterproductive and self-defeating. The economic embargo is an, a near textbook case of a policy that is punitive against third parties with no connection with Cuba and it's failed and Western policy must change but this has nothing to do with admiration for the achievements of the regime. Pedro Perez Cazón, as a Cuban, when you saw what Castro was doing internationally, the interventions in Angola, in South Africa, in Nicaragua, various other places, what did you feel? I feel very proud. I mean, I wouldn't be able just to what Mr. Cazón was saying about I mean, the revolution was made for people not necessarily like him. It wasn't necessarily made for the people that weren't, didn't have what we have right now, which is a different, a different thing. And when I saw my Cuban people being in Africa, I felt very proud of it. Definitely, I feel very proud. And if you see what's going on in Miami right now, you will see that most of those people doing demonstration along in Miami are white folks, white Cubans from Hispanic descent. And it happened exactly the very same that happened when Nelson Mandela was invited to visit Miami. It was all the commissionados from Miami, the area, that really made all the possible that they want to in order for Mandela not to visit Mr. Miami. Mr. Cazón, did Castro do anything positive at all? Castro, of course, like any other government, they've been in power for 50 years. The price the Cuban people have had to pay is out of proportion. Let me just say yeah, Hang that, on a second. Uh, My question... There, there no, hang, no, hang on. Yeah. The question is perfectly straightforward. Did Castro yeah. do anything positive? Well, Castro has done something to remain in power. I don't believe Hitler or Franco or Pinochet have done many things positive. Uh, you look at the leadership of the Cuban government. See how many black faces you see. Look at the hotels and the beaches where Cubans, black and white, are not allowed. Uh, why doesn't the International Committee of Red Cross can enter Cuba? Uh, that has nothing to do with American policy. It has to do with a horrible dictatorship that has been imposed on the Cuban people. The Cuban people want a so revolution, <laughs> the but that's not what the they got. Whether he did anything positive uh, to, hasn't got us uh, very far. But let well, us I'll tell you. Well, well, wait, 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 wait. What's positive? No, no, he you, destroyed I'm the sorry, sugar economy. I'm sorry, Chum. I've asked you the question twice, and you can't answer it. It's fair enough. You're entitled to your view. Of course you are. We respect that. But let's look at the question now of where Cuba goes next. How does the rest of the world deal with Cuba? Oliver Cam, what would you say? I think the United States should discreetly lift the economic embargo, which has poisoned relations with the European Union. Conversely, the European Union should not precipitately welcome the new regime as a changed situation, as it did when Raul Castro took over, and should explicitly support democratic forces and human rights observers in the island. George Galloway, you presume you support much of that, wouldn't you? Yes, and the European Union has already made a very positive démarche to opening it with Cuba, and that's got best way to return to billion analogy. Giorgio, in this case, definitely better than war, war. And you're hearing from Mr. Calzon exactly the kind of warlike noises from the other side of the Atlantic that has led to the 50 years of estrangement. And now's the time, and Barack Obama has already indicated that if he's the president, he's prepared to engage with Cuba. The European Union's prepared to engage. These uh, emigres, the bordello owners and the casino owners who were driven out of Cuba, will gnash their teeth and will that the future uh, for the Cuban people and it will be if we are positively engaged with right. them. Right. Reported just a couple of weeks ago when Cuba refuses to talk about human rights with the European Union and and the the words of bordellos and all that stuff. That's the kind of the uh, words that the Stalinists used to use. I think we have to be respectful of people who disagree with us. Not only of me, but the Cuban people. The Cuban people should have the right in Cuba to decide their destiny. 
not in London, not in Washington, in Cuba. Let the Cuban people speak. Okay, gentlemen, thank you all uh, very much indeed.